Philippians chapter 1, we're looking at <clears throat> Paul's introduction and salutation continued. Uh, we're almost done with the uh, greeting. We're going to look at the greeting of the bishops and the deacons. And then we're going to look at Paul's thanksgiving for the people in Philippians, the church in Philippians, and we're going to get into Paul's prayer. It's a very, very interesting material. Pay close attention. I'm going to read all of chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who be, has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you, all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus to all the glory and praise of God. <coughs> but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfless ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowledge, that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I should be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet, what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you in your progress and joy of faith. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Thus sent the reading of God's holy word. We're continuing <coughs> with the greeting, and we only have a little bit left. Paul also addresses the bishops, and the word there means overseer, along with the deacons. And of course, overseer is an elder. It was not in Paul's usual procedure to address the office bearers of the church. Therefore, some different views have been offered as to why he does here. Some believe he wanted to acknowledge them because they were integral in sending the gift through Epaphroditus. It's possible. Others think perhaps that, uh, some of the church had a low, low view of the legitimate rulership in the church, the ecclesiastical authority, and that Paul wanted to publicly acknowledge them. No one really knows, and so that's all speculation. But he does greet the elders and the deacons, indicating... Uh, two offices. The elders translated bishops in the King James Version and the New King James versions, Version are overseers of the flock. The fact that pastor teachers are not mentioned shows us that the term overseers or elders can be used to describe both the teaching and ruling elders in the church. 
They're both elders. They both have different functions. Some teach, some rule. Some teach and rule, some simply rule, with teaching be, being much less important. Elders or overseers developed out of the Old Testament elders who ruled in the gate, those who served as leaders of the synagogue, all who were responsible for spiritual oversight and judicial decisions. In the New Testament church, their duties are spiritual, and they are specifically charged to lead, govern, supervise, and conduct discipline in the church when necessary. The teaching elders additionally are responsible for preaching, teaching, and administering the sacraments. We're all familiar with that. Paul greets them. We need to identify what they are. In Acts 10, 27 to 30, the relief raised in the church at Antioch for the aid of the saints in Judea due to a famine was delivered to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And that's Acts 11.30. This occurred in A.D. 44. Sometime between A.D. 44 and 50 on his first missionary journey, Paul appointed, and if we study the uh, Greek terminology there, that is, he supervised the election of elders in every church. Elders were elected to rule in every church, and of course, every church was to have a teaching elder, at least one. In the year 57, or 58, Paul, on his third missionary journey, when he comes to Miletus on the coast of Asia Minor, summons the elders, verse 17, or overseers, verse 28. So we see in that passage very clearly that overseers, translated bishop in the King James, and elders are synonymous. And he gives them a touching farewell. A little while after writing Philippians, sometime after his first Roman imprisonment, but not long after AD 63, Paul will list the detailed requirements for elders or overseers in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. And that's where we get the requirements. The term elder emphasizes age, wisdom, The biblical wisdom to rule, why the expression overseer refers to the officer's duty to oversee the flock. Now, quite a long time after the close of the New Testament canon, the expression overseers or bishop was applied to men above local pastors in a parish or elders in a parish. And these men ruled over several churches and had the authority to appoint and depose pastors. And that, of course, is extra-biblical. It's added after the close of the canon. It's not taught in Scripture. It cannot be proved by Scripture. And therefore, it is an unbiblical practice, and we call it episcopacy or prelacy. And that, of course, developed into the apostate Roman Catholic Church and their government, which is thoroughly hierarchical and has nothing in common with the Word of God. <clears throat> it is very unscriptural and very, very dangerous. The office of deacon is a separate office from elder, consisting solely of men chosen and ordained to handle duties of Christian charity. They had the responsibility of collecting the tithes, the funds, the superintending, the dis distribution of alms, paying the pastor or pastors, making uh, sure that the physical aspects of the church were taken care of, the building, the lighting, paying the bills and all those sorts of things. They first come into view in Acts chapter 6 as the elected ordained office to wait on tables and care for the aged widows so that the apostles could completely devote themselves to the word of God and prayer. And we note that in Acts chapter 6, the men appointed, uh, the people appointed were all men and they had to be men. There was no such thing as women deacons. There was the order of widows and the order of widows, of course, is a separate function than men deacons and the order of widows is a non-ordained function to help the deacons assist with womenly things with women and of course in the ancient church uh, that's exactly what they did the office of uh, women serving the same office as men deacons is a late innovation it is heretical it is wrong and was introduced in the rpcna in the 1880s totally unscriptural while deacons do not have authority for teaching and judgment, 
in the church, like elders. They are, they are a very important office, especially in times of poverty. And in the ancient world, there was a lot of poverty. The deacons were a lot more busy than they are now. Well, that brings us to the salutation in verse 2. In verse 2, we come to the salutation proper. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Paul pronounces upon all the saints and church officers in Philippi grace, which refers to God's sovereign, unmerited favor. It's an expression of his love from before the foundation of the world upon those who deserve the act exact opposite. Now, in normal parlance, grace can simply mean favor, but when we're talking about the doctrine of Christian grace, the doctrine of biblical grace to sinners, it is unmerited favor. It's always unmerited favor to those who deserve the exact opposite. Thus, grace is always connected to and flows from the redemptive work of Christ. As Paul says in Ephesians, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Here's another one. Ephesians 1.3. God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Here's 1.7. In Him we have redemption through His blood. 1.11. In Him we have also obtained an inheritance. And then 2.5. God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So grace is always connected to Christ, and apart from Christ, there is no biblical grace. Apart from Christ, there can be no biblical grace, because unmerited favor is rooted in the blood of Christ, and his sinless life, his redemptive work, his glorious cross, his resurrection, it can be rooted in nothing else. Now, the word grace in the original, and this is important to keep in mind, is very similar. It's the usual way of greeting someone by Greek writers. You would see this word grace in the beginning of their letters. Paul, however, is not simply being friendly and polite, but fills the word with Christian content. And then he adds the word peace which is the characteristic Hebrew greeting. Grace is the, would be the Greek greeting. Peace, shalom, would be the Hebrew greeting. He brings the two together, and of course they're informed by biblical doctrine. He uses peace not simply as a feeling of inner peace or composure, but in a comprehensive biblical peace. Sense, peace with God, peace with man through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us not forget that. Paul is using things in a distinctly Christian way and a distinctly biblical way. Paul connects grace with peace because God's grace in Christ gives us peace with God. We are reconciled to God through the blood of the cross. And having been reconciled with God, the Holy Spirit progressively brings peace to this earth as the kingdom of Christ leavens the lump. Peace between men. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, the angel declared at the birth of the incarnation of Christ. The salvation is identical. The salutation is identical to the one used in Romans 1.7, 1 Corinthians 1.3, 2 Corinthians 1.2, Galatians 1.3, Ephesians 1.2, Philemon 1.7, and it's very similar to 2 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> Whenever we read these salutations, and we read them all the time, we must keep in mind that they... They are a sincere declaration on Paul's part and are not merely a pious platitude or being friendly, like in a regular Greek letter. Paul means what he says. Paul's writing under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are the very word, this is the very word of God must be taken seriously. And then this brings us to Paul's thanksgiving and prayer. In the apostle's normal practice, it was his normal practice to begin his epistles with a thanksgiving that leads into prayer, or we could consider the thanksgiving as even part of the prayer. This epistle is no different. He says this, he writes this, uh, and this will be 1, 3 to 5. I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests with all joy, 
for your fellowship in the gospel until now. So Paul rejoices in God when he thinks about the Christians at Philippi. He reflects on how God sovereignly led him to the elect in that city. Three times the Holy Spirit had to communicate to him, no, you're, you're going to go over here. We're sending, you to, we're sending you to Europe. The triune God, we're going to send you to Europe. And you're going to preach where we want you to preach. He thinks upon the church's love and service to Christ and its help of himself, and he is jubilant. Therefore, he says, I thank my God. We should learn a proper Christian attitude, a proper way of encouraging other Christians by imitating Paul in this thanksgiving. If we look at his letters, we see a perfect balance of love and encouragement with strictness and rebukes, when deserved, of course. He delights to recognize good in those to whom he writes and thus encourage their continued goodness, even in cases where there may be much also to correct or reprove. This is a way to win hearts and encourage continuance in the good by praising the good. We all know that this is something good to do with children. When they're good, praise them for it. When they're bad, they need to be reproved. Philippians stands in stark contrast with Galatians, the book of Galatians, where immediately after the salutation comes the strong and stern statement, this is Galatians 1, 6-7, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So we see that Paul does not praise in an artificial or phony way. He doesn't praise when praise is not deserved. When he finds a reason to praise, he gives praise. When he doesn't find a reason to pra praise, he doesn't give praise. When brukes are necessary, he rebukes. The problem with many churchmen in our day is that much praise is phony and unwarranted. Moreover, when rebukes are necessary, especially over theological errors, they rarely, if ever, come. And why is that? Well, today that scene is unloving. That scene is not kind. Oh, how dare you rebuke false doctrine? We need to be building bridges, not walls. I've heard that before, and it's nonsense. Like Paul, we must delight in those who do good, and we must praise God for it. But if we, all, we also must be willing to call error, error, and rebuke it to protect the faith once delivered to the saints. Love does not excuse sin. It rebukes it. Love does not tolerate error. It reproves it. Now, it must be done in a loving, kind way, but it has to reprove error. It's not legalistic to reprove error. It's not unloving to reprove error. It must be done in, a, in a, hum, uh, a humble manner, in a loving manner, in a gentle manner, but it must be done. As Christians who have new hearts that love God, Christ, and His Word, there should be a constant overflow of thanks to our Father in Heaven for what He has done for us and for our brethren. Let us learn to give thanks to the good of others. The natural man who lives under the power of worldliness and darkness has a natural tendency to not be truly sympathetic with others. Yes, they build hospitals. Unbelievers can build hospitals and they can do works of charity and they can open up a soup kitchen. They can feed the hungry at times, but they do not do this out of a love to God or for the glory of Christ. They don't. They are acts of self-glorification. We should all be working for the progress of the Savior's kingdom, and we should be thanking God for the good he does for others. Paul in his thanksgiving, where he's focusing on the blessing, blessings in others, shifts to a parenthetical thought, and note how he moves from thanksgiving to petitions on their behalf. Here we go. Always in every prayer of mine making... Request for you with all joy, verse 4. There is not a single prayer of Paul's where he fails to include 
the Philippians. Not one of the saints is outside a circle of love, care, and interest. And the revised version's rendering, in every supplication of mine is more literal than saying in my prayers. Inasmuch as the noun used by Paul is not the word meaning prayer in general, but the word devoting pra uh, denoting prayer in one of its aspects, prayer as entreaty or supplication. In every supplication of mine, I have you in my heart. I have you in my mind. I'm thinking about you. I'm, I'm, I'm setting you before the throne of grace. And then it follows the statement, I pray with a sense of joy. Paul supplicates with joy. His petitions are saturated with joy. He does not have to force himself to pray for the Philippians, for their behavior and attitude makes his task easy. Oh, that we can be more like Paul. There are those who grieve the elders. The elders who are above them grieve and are distressed at their childish, immature, and unbiblical behavior. Such people make the task of prayer more difficult, but not so with the Philippians. When Paul prayed for the Philippians, he did it with all joy. The immediate reason for the thanksgiving is given in verse 5. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The ultimate reason is given in verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. These two thoughts must not be separated. In essence, Paul is saying, your perseverance in sympathetic participation in the work of the gospel, verse 5, has convinced me that you are the objects of divine preservation. Verse 6. And we find the same kind of reasoning in 2 Thessalonians 1, 2 to 5, where the believers, day by day, obedient living, is regarded as evidence of this election from eternity. For all of this, Paul gives thanks to God. Now, to be partakers of the gospel is only accomplished by means of faith. We embrace Christ by faith. We lay hold of Christ through the instrument of faith. Christ earned our salvation. He's the foundation of redemption. His blood removes our sin. His sacrificial death, his suffering on the cross removes the guilt and penalty of sin. And his perfect sinless life is imputed or reckoned to our account. Thus we lay hold of the merits of Christ solely by faith, not by works. Apart from a regenerated heart, the gospel means nothing to us. But when it is received with joy, and continued in for a good period of time. <clears throat> it is strong evidence of an eternal election. The phrase until now denotes their perseverance. Anyone who has been a Christian for a long period of time knows how crucial it is not simply to express a faith in Christ or to have a profession of faith in Christ, a credible profession, to believe in Christ, to say you believe in Christ, you must do it for a long time. You must per persevere in it. You must love the gospel. You must persevere in the gospel. They know that perseverance in the truth and obedience is the test of a genuine believer. Most of the people I know over the years, many, many, many people who profess faith in Christ have fallen away. I'd say over half. They don't even go to church anymore or they've apostatized into Romanism or Eastern Orthodoxy or heresy or whatever. You have to persevere. There are many who profess faith for a time but fall away due to fickleness, inconstancy, and a love of this present world. Let it not be you. As Christians, we must view salvation in the broad sense, not simply the narrow sense. It is certainly true that the moment we believe in Jesus Christ, the very moment we place our faith in Him, we are saved. We are justified. We are declared righteous by God the Father in the heavenly court 
because of the merits of Jesus Christ, because of his sacrificial death which washes away our sin, which eliminates the curse due to the violating his law, and of course, his imputed righteousness, his righteousness, his perfect law keeping is reckoned to our account. And thus, to say we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We're, we're declared righteous. And that takes place in a moment of time. And that's salvation in the narrow sense. But we are not saved in the fullest sense of the term until Jesus comes back, the second coming. And we are resurrected from the dead and receive glorified immortal bodies. As Christians, we must look at the Christian life as a long marathon and not as simply a short sprint. Now, we know that the day we die, we're going to be with Christ in heaven, face to face of the Lord, our spirits. But according to Scripture, the physical body is also to be redeemed by Christ. The Christian world and life view is diametrically opposed to Neoplatonism and full preterism, which dis both which disregard the human body and regard it as irrelevant and even evil. Now, the full preterists probably wouldn't say it's evil, but they'd say it's completely irrelevant. Your body's never going to rise from the dead. That's a heresy. That's a damnable heresy. Christ came to save the whole man, body and soul. And you're not fully saved, completely saved, in the broad sense of the term, until the day of resurrection. The time of our perfection, in the fullest sense, begins at the second coming of our Lord when our pure spirit is reunited with our new, sinless, perfect, glorified, spiritual bodies. As we live our lives as Christians, we must keep that day in our minds. Meditate on that day every day. Live with that day in mind. Live with that day in mind, the day of judgment, the day of reckoning, the day when you come out of the tomb and your body is reunited with your soul. Our life is a Christian marathon with many trials and temptations, many tribulations, Yes, we must always be trusted in Christ's redeeming work and his efficacious work in us. And the fact that we persevere due to God's grace alone. Yet, at the same time, in the sphere of sanctification, we are responsible to work hard at our sanctification and perseverance. You're responsible to get up and pray, to pray before you go to bed, to pray in the middle of the day, to read your Bible every day, to read good Christian books, to make sure you go to a church where the preaching is solid, Bible-believing preaching, to make sure that you're uh, fellowshipping with solid, Reformed Christians who really believe the Word and really practice the Word and don't corrupt the worship of God and pervert things. It's your responsibility to persevere. It's your responsibility to, be, to help in the process of sanctification, even though ultimately God gets all the credit and it's due to the grace of, uh, of Christ. We are only sanctified in Christ and uh, it's His the efficacy of his death and resurrection that gives us the power to be holy, that enables us to break the power of sin. And indeed, in our regeneration, which the Puritans called initial sanctification, the power of sin is broken, even though we are still sinners and we sin every day. But we can follow Christ, and due to the Spirit, we can persevere to the very end. <clears throat> One of the most important things to note about these verses is our fellowship in the gospel, which is a fellowship of grace. The word used for fellowship here is koinonia, which denotes more than an interest in partnership in the gospel, and some of the translations simply say our partnership in the gospel. We are a body, a family, a covenant together. Regarding this fellowship, we should note the following observations. Number one, it is a fellowship of grace. It is not something that normally arises from nature or friendship. It is not man-made or called into being by man. It is not like those people who form a club or a secret society or a sports team or a singing group. It's none of that. It's called together by the grace of God. It is not something merited by men or achieved through human power. It is sovereignly affected by Jesus Christ, by his incarnation, his sacrificial death, his redemptive work, his sinless life, his glorious resurrection. The efficacy of Jesus' redemptive work is communicated by his Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 13, Philippians 2, 1, who is sent by the Father and the Son into our hearts. 
Jesus rose from the dead as a divine human mediator, the theanthropic Christ, sits at the right hand of God the Father. He is the one who sends his spirit into your heart, raising it from the dead, giving it new life, and causing it to love him and to believe in the gospel. Apart from Christ and the Holy Spirit, this fellowship is totally impossible. So we must be especially thankful for this fellowship. Jesus, by his perfect work of redemption, draws all the elect to himself. He does this by his word and his spirit, the inner and outer call. And that is why it is called the fellowship of the gospel. We are made alive and raised with Christ. We live in the heavenly places with him. We are seated with him at the right hand of God. Our justification and even our regeneration and sanctification are gifts of grace from Christ. It is all of grace. And it brings all of us into a special fellowship of grace. We are brought into the covenant together for a distinct purpose. Two, it is consequently a fellowship of faith. We embrace Jesus Christ by faith and thus faith leads us to fellowship with each other. Number three, the fellowship of grace leads to fellowship in prayer, thanksgiving and purpose. Believers worship as individuals and as families and as churches. The idea of individual Christians or even families not being part of a church, not joining themselves to the visible church, is a contradiction of this fellowship. Now there's certainly a sense where every, every believer and their children are part of the visible church. Don't get me wrong, that's absolutely true. But we're responsible to join ourselves to, for lack of a better term, the institutional church or the church that has a body of elders and a group of men all in covenant together, all who are accountable to each other, all who hold to a good solid standard of faith and good terms of communion. We're all responsible for that. There's a fellowship of believers, one with another, a fellowship of love, one for another. And this means treating each other lawfully. It means not gossip about, gossiping about each other or backbiting. Christians shouldn't act like a bunch of pagans, a bunch of judgmental jerks, judging each other and bad-mouthing each other behind their backs. It's a fellowship of love. It's a fellowship of grace. It means communicating effectively and biblically to resolve conflicts and personality problems. It means not forsaking the body because of minor issues or personality conflicts. People who walk away from the church over minor issues, over things that are easily resolved, show a great deal of immaturity and a lack of sanctification, and they are showing that they may not even be regenerate if they act that way. It means helping each other, praying for each other, and contributing to each other's needs. We are to remember the poor among us, those who are weak and struggling, those who are sick and are suffering. The Philippians acted on this principle of fellowship by looking after uh, Paul's needs and by actively promoting the work of the gospel. They were happy to promote the gospel. They were happy to help Paul. They knew he was preaching the truth. They knew he was doing God's work. And they wanted to support that. And then number four. It is a fellowship in separation. We are united in our separation from the world. <clears throat> it is a fellowship over against the world. Attachment to Christ <clears throat> always involves detachment from the world. That is from a worldly way of thinking and acting. There can be no fellowship between light and darkness, between Christ and Satan, between Christianity and secular humanism. If this aspect of separation breaks down, the other aspects of fellowship will suffer and begin to fall apart. A hearty cooperation in the gospel and the fellowship that, entail, uh, that, entails, uh, that, that entails involves a fellowship in warfare against the world. The church is not some thing, place where you simply escape. It's not a form of escapism, but it's a training center for spiritual warfare. It's a training center 
so that the Dominion Mandate, which is now the Great Commission, can move forward so that all nations can be discipled for Christ. We must hold fast to the gospel and we must struggle side by side against the common foe. We live in dark times. We live in terrible times. We live in a time of apostasy and declension. We live in times when the secular humanists are beginning to persecute Christians over sodomite marriage and other things. And it's only going to get worse. And it's gotten this way because Christians didn't struggle together. They had a very narrow, reductionist concept of the Word of God and its application to society. We must avoid that. Now, a wonderful example of Christian fellowship and its implications is found in Lydia, one of Paul's first converts. As soon as the Holy Spirit opened her heart to know and embrace the gospel, <coughs> she opened her home to Paul and his associates, Acts 16, 14, and 15. Come, I'll help you out. You need a place to stay? You need some food? And she kept her house open. In fact, she opened it wide and she made it available so that what became the headquarters for these missionaries ended up becoming the meeting place of the local church. It was a meeting place of public worship. How nice. It was a house church or a place of assembly for all the early converts at Philippi, Acts 1640. When we think of fellowship, we should also think of the Philippian jailer, who upon his conversion turned from a slave of the state, a slave of Rome, to a servant of Jesus Christ. He washed the missionary stripes, and he gave them food to eat, Acts 16, 19 to 34. People have a view of the church today, what, you know, what's in it for me? they got a good youth group, and they have fun activities for the kids, and they look at it as kind of a club, an entertainment center. But that's not the way we should look at church. It's a place where we should go to serve others. It's a place where, you know, uh, where we want to further the kingdom of Christ. We want to do what we can to help the other people in the body be sanctified and help them. We want to do what we can for the furtherance of the gospel, for the fervor, fur, furtherance of reformation. But people have a terrible attitude today. They look at the churches like they're going to a club or a nightclub or some kind of entertainment or, uh, you know, what's in it for me? We're supposed to be servants to each other, not selfish and worldly. Let us always keep before our minds the implications of the fellowship of grace. And then we come to the apostles' affection in verses 7 to 8. Paul continues by expressing his deep affection for the saints at Philippi. <clears throat> Just that it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have given you an I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. Paul's attitude regarding the Philippian saints is made clear in the beginning of this long sentence. When, wherever he was, whenever he was at the throne of grace, his heart was enlarged on their account. His affections were wonderfully drawn out towards them. They were on his mind both when he was imprisoned <clears throat> and when he was preaching the gospel and defending the faith. <clears throat> oh, we want to be more like Paul. Paul notes that his attitude was right, correct, or biblical. <clears throat> this implies that it is a moral obligation for us to imitate Paul, to imitate Paul's attitude with the Christians in our circles. The heart in, in Scripture is the mainspring of the intellect, the will, and the emotions. Out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. The Bible teaches us that in sanctification, our goal is not simply an outward obedience, but an obedience that extends to the very heart. The Pharisees were meticulous about outward things, but inside, they were, they were like whitewashed tombs, inside full of dead man's bones, full of hatred and contempt and evil. While on the outside, they looked, appeared very religious. Well, that's not Christianity. We, we want to be concerned about heart obedience. We want to be concerned about a proper Christian attitude. And that's something that we have to strive for. That's, it's, it's not that hard to outwardly obey at times. 
But inwardly, to have the heart right, that's a chore, and that deserves uh, special attention. Paul longed for them with the affection of Christ. This was not a carnal or phony affection, but a spiritual and distinctly Christian affection. We seek to imitate Paul who imitated Christ. We need to learn to imitate and follow the tender concern which Jesus himself has for his own people. Christ is full of compassion to poor sinners. It was in compassion to them that he undertook this, their salvation and suffered on their behalf. From Paul we learn that we must have love, pity, and compassion for those whom Jesus has had such a love and pity and compassion. We must meditate on the word and develop our inward disposition toward Christians that is like Christ, that is like Paul. This is an implicit rebuke to the backbiting, the infighting, the gossiping, the lack of love, the lack of forgiveness found among so many professing Christians today. Judgmental jerks. If we see sin in a brother, what is our goal? To gossip about them and put them down and see how many people we can get to hate them? No. Our goal is to go to them privately and communicate with them and help them be a better Christian. We don't see that today. We see a bunch of gossip and backbiting. Let us be like Paul. Let us be like Christ. Let us really love our brethren and not simply talk about it and be a bunch of rotten hypocrites who sit around gossiping. Let's do our job and communicate effectively and biblically and help each other be better Christians. And then, in verses 9 to 11, we come to Paul's petition on their account. In verses 9 to 11, we find the content of his prayer on their behalf. We're only going to begin this. We don't have enough time to finish it. It would have been good for me to try to finish it, but we've gotten pretty long here. Here's what Paul says in 9 to 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. <clears throat> this is an example of the particular prayer that Paul usually offered in behalf of the Philippians. The longing of Christian love quite naturally flows into Christian prayer. Therefore, we clearly see the logical connection between the statement, I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ, and this I pray. If you care about somebody, if you love them, if you want them to do better, you've got to pray for them. It's wonderful to care about people and love them, but that has to go forth into Christian action. And one of those actions, of course, is Christian prayer. Prayer is the logical and emotional extension of the longing soul. Paul wants his spiritual children to know that he prays for them and what he prays for them. This will not only encourage and comfort us, but it also teaches us how we ought to pray, what we ought to pray for, and strive for. It is a great encouragement for us to know that we are prayed for by our friends, who we have reason to think have an interest in the throne of grace. <coughs> And it, it, it makes me extremely happy when people contact me and they tell me they're praying for me because I need every bit of it. What Paul prays for is illuminating and informative. It contains a number of important elements. Like I said, we're just going to start this. We don't have time to finish, but we're going to look at this. First, assuming that the Philippians already possessed Christian love, one for another, he wants God to increase that love. The word love, agape, is found throughout Paul's epistles. Very important term. The love of God to elect sinners produces love in them, and this love is extended to Christ, to God, the people of God, and even to all men in general. Love is the motivation and emotional source of the good work which God has already begun in them. Love toward God and our fellow man is the very essence and foundation of the moral law. When we think of Christian love, we must think of the moral law. They're intimately connected. The love of which Paul speaks is not some undefined emotion. 
It is not a word of which uh, we are allowed uh, our heathen culture to define or the world to define. Love is not simply feeling or autonomous emotions undirected or uncontrolled. The love of which Paul speaks <clears throat> is biblically directed and informed, spiritually intelligent with a full-orbed Christian ethic that delights in serving Christ. Love apart from biblical meaning, love apart from biblical definition, love apart from the law of God and Christian ethics is generally useless and harmful. When Paul prays for the Philippians love to increase more and more, he is praying for an increase of the central fruit of the Spirit. He is praying for hearts that are more and more sanctified, more and more diligent in serving God and doing good works. A lukewarm, sinful people are not a loving people. People who gossip or lash out instead of communicating and resolving problems in the church are not acting in a loving manner at all. Self-righteous hypocrites. Love rejoices in the truth, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13, and love keeps the commandments of God. Jesus repeated that at least twice, and we find that in 1 John more than once. Many Christians divorce love from God's law or commandments and thus end up following our culture instead of the Bible. Oh, well, we've got to be loving. So, you know, I know Joe wants to divorce his wife and, you know, divorce is frowned upon in the Bible, but, you know, we have to love him and encourage him in his sin. Now, they don't put it that crassly, but that's what happens today. If we do not connect love to the moral law, our love will be uninformed, antinomian, and promiscuous. <clears throat> Such a false concept of love has led many evangelical churches to accept divorce for any cause, to loosen the proper biblical attitude towards homosexuality, and to allow doctrinal pluralism, and of course, all sorts of innovations in worship, all of these things are actually unloving and have been a disaster for evangelical churches. Now, I'm not saying you need to be a jerk about things, but we have to stand up for the truth. And if you don't stand up for the truth, that's not love. Many, many years ago, we had to do a discipline case where a woman had left her husband in a very negative, nasty way, and uh, we barred her from the Lord's table vote was unanimous on the session. This is over a decade ago. This is many, many years ago. And uh, we were told by another minister, oh, well, that's unloving. How dare you? Well, we said, you know, love is defined by in Scripture according to the law of God. And of course, his response was, well, love is much more than simply the law of God. Well, all he was doing was being antinomian and making excuses. To discipline a child who is disobedient is Christian love, if it's done correctly. Discipline in the church is a form of Christian love, if it's done correctly and biblically, obviously. We've got to get this thought out of our heads that antinomianism and being permissive and tolerating all sorts of things in the church that are unscriptural are love. That those things are loving, that they're not loving. They're the opposite of love. Love speaks the truth. Love rejoices in that which is right. Love rejoices in the truth. Love does not tolerate error. So we've got to get that common evangelical way of thinking out of our minds, which of course has permeated many Reformed churches. I've been told I'm unloving and a jerk and, and all sorts of things simply because I wrote a book against celebrating Christmas, which is a Roman Catholic and pagan holy day. It's not legalistic to say we can't do something that is not authorized by the Word of God. That's not legalism, and that's not unloving. It's simply the truth. Second, in line with what we've already begun to consider, Paul wants their love to increase in knowledge. Very interesting. The word for knowledge is not the simple word for knowledge, which is gnosis, but a compound word, epignosis. 
These words can be used and are usually used synonymously in the New Testament. But if a distinction is drawn between these two words, epignosis is taken to mean a full, thorough, clear, accurate, comprehensive knowledge. <coughs> Interestingly, Paul in his prison epistles, when he's discussing prayer and knowledge, always uses the compound word epignosis. The word knowledge here is not knowledge in general, but biblical, ethical, and spiritual knowledge. The more we know about God, the more we know about God's nature and character, who God is, who He really is, the better will be our prayers. And if you go back and you read your Bible and you study the prayers of great men of God, you'll see they use their knowledge of God in their prayers quite effectively. The more we know about God's moral law, Christian ethics and biblical examples of holiness, the more biblical and effective our prayers will be. You can't identify sin if you don't know God's law. The more you know God's law, the more you hide it in your heart, the more you know about Christian ethics and, and the, the law, the more you can confess your sins effectively. If we're going to pray in accordance with God's will, we need to know God's will. The more we know about Jehovah, <coughs> the greater will be our thankfulness, our adoration, and our worship. The more that we know about God's law, the more thorough will be our confession of sin and petitions for help and, and holiness. With more and more biblical knowledge come a greater quality of love toward God and man. Then I have a wonderful quote from a 19th century Scottish preacher named Robert Johnson. Here's what he says. Love is the grand sanctifying, ennobling, beautifying principle of the Christian soul. It is in truth itself the sum of moral excellence. For all forms of holy feeling and holy action are but various manifestations of love to God and to man. Love is the fulfillment of the law. The end of the commandment of love out of a pure heart, out of a good conscience, and a faith unfeigned. Now to love God, the sincere and unfelicious love to man, with which love to God is always associated, springs from knowledge of God and of man's real relations to God. It is impossible consistently within the realm of nature, within the nature of things, that it should be otherwise. <clears throat> a heart which is in darkness, filled with grievous misconceptions of God and of happiness, and such as is every human heart by nature, that is unregenerate man, cannot love God, nor unselfishly love man. It is faith, the intelligent and cordial belief of divine truth that worketh by love. Excellent statement. Yes, love is crucial. God is love. And if we want to be like God, we need to be more loving. But love is defined by God, not by man. Love is defined by the Bible, not by our culture. Love is defined by the law of God, not by Hollywood and the Supreme Court, who are pro-sodomite. We need to define love in the way God defines love. Otherwise, our love will be antinomian and promiscuous. Strong passions without knowledge and biblical wisdom will not make us competent in God's will and often can do more harm than good. The Jews had a zeal for God, but not, Paul says, according to knowledge. <clears throat> and thus were led into violence, rage, and murder. Romans 10, 2 and John 16, 2. And the very opposite of Paul's prayer can be found among the charismatic movement. Now, I was a charismatic. I was Pentecostal for a few years there. And we were told, well, you know what you need to do? You need to pray in tongues. You just need to pray in tongues. Where people are told to speak in tongues during prayer, which is not biblical tongues at all, which were real languages, which could be translated into the known language of that time for people's edification. But modern tongues are an unintelligible gibberish. So instead of praying according to knowledge, they're praying according to complete gibberish and ignorance. To help us form our prayers according to the fuller biblical knowledge, we would do well to take notes. To take notes and even write out some prayers. Calvin wrote out prayers. Some of the early Presbyterians wrote out prayers. I'm not advocating that you have to go get a prayer book or anything, but write out your prayers fill in the content of your prayers. It'll help you when you pray without notes. But it's a good method of training 
to pray more effectively. We want to pray according to knowledge. I hope you study theology. I hope you study the Bible. I hope you study the other prayers in the Bible, such as the Lord's Prayer and the prayers of Paul and the prayers of great saints. And look at the book of Psalms, which are full of prayers. It'll help you pray better. So we need biblical knowledge. We need to love God's law and put it in our heart. We need to study God's nature and character. It'll all make us pray way better for each other and for ourselves. Now we're going to end here. We're going to come back. We've got a lot to consider in this amazing opening chapter of Philippians. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks to this book. What a wonderful, amazing book it is. We thank you for your Apostle Paul and for inspiring him to give us such edifying material for our benefit. We pray, Lord, that you would help us learn how to pray according to knowledge, that you would increase our love for the saints, that you would make us more and more like Paul. What an example, because he followed Christ so closely, we want to follow him and imitate his example, Lord. Help us, for we fall short in all these things. Help us, Lord, to be more obedient and more loving of your people and more compassionate toward your people and a people of deep prayer, like Paul. In Jesus' name, amen.